Good evening, everyone. I'm Chris Reardon, Dean of the Daniels College of Business. Welcome to the first Voices of Experience of 2012. I'm delighted tonight to have our guest, Chairman and CEO of Noodles and Company, Kevin Reddy. Now, think back to when you were a kid. What was on your top five list of favorite foods to eat? Mac and cheese, buttered noodles, noodles with red sauce, anything with noodles made my top five list. How cool is the job that he has to be the CEO of a concept restaurant that's dedicated to noodles? He made every kid and every parent in Colorado and the United States exceedingly happy with this concept. I, wanted to, I brought Kevin out here on stage because I want to tell a few stories about him. Kevin is also part of our executive advisory board here in the Daniels College of Business. And this past fall, my board decided to go international. So we're actually adding subboards in China, the United Kingdom, and India this year alone. And then we hope to expand down into South America by late 2012, early 2013. As I was talking with my board and I was talking with Kevin about moving into China, the first thing he said to me was, we're taking noodles to China. And I had to stop and think about that one for a minute. <laughs> okay, the top two countries in the world known for noodles are what? China and Italy. So if he doesn't talk about it tonight, someone from the audience has to ask Kevin about his expansion into China. The other thing I have to say is Kevin was one of the first executives that I met when I landed here in Denver. He was very kind to take an appointment with me and immediately he said, we will partner with the Daniels College of Business and he hosts student consulting teams from our marketing department in his organization. That's really what I call giving back to the community and helping our students learn about the restaurant business and also about how to be a leader. Kevin, can you help me out a little bit and thank our other corporate sponsors tonight Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, and it is great being associated with the University of Denver. Um, first, I want to thank our financial sponsors. We have four that, that really just do a wonderful job, and without them, um, so many things just would not happen uh, that are great for the community and the university. So um, I'd like to thank uh, Grant Thornton, First Bank, CoBank, and this is the tough one, the tongue twister, Hamilton, Fats, and Waller. Um, we had to practice the middle word so he didn't mispronounce that one. <laughs> <laughs> Close social faux pas would be a real problem there. Um, our in-kind sponsors, uh, Chase Bank, uh, Rocky Mountain House Resources of People and Strategy, um, NACD, the National Association of Corporate Directors, Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce, Net Impact, and the Marketing Roundtable. Um, you know, please, I want to thank them, and if you guys get a chance, please thank them as well. Stay here. Yeah. No, no, stay here. All right, so now's my chance to brag a little bit about Kevin before he gets on. Um, so Kevin started his career as a server, right, at McDonald's? Yes. A cashier at McDonald's. He moved his way up into management. He was then recruited by Chipotle when they had just a mere 13 stores. Is that right? That's correct. And as chief operating officer, he helped the company grow over 400 stores in 22 states. Yeah, close to 480, 500 in seven years. Isn't that amazing? Quite incredible. That's exactly why he was recruited into Noodles and Company. He started as president in 2005, became CEO in 2006, and chairman in 2008. And he was just sharing with me that they're topping over 300 million in terms of revenue, and they are now close to over, oh, close to 400 stores. Is that right? Yeah, 200, no, we just ended the year around 285 restaurants and uh, 300 million in system-wide sales. So, and we're long runway ahead of us. That's terrific. Well, the other thing that you need to know, here's a fast fact that you can keep in your head. What do, would you guess that Kevin and David Beckham have in common? <laughs> Any guesses? Has nothing to do with what he's advertising. <laughs> <laughs> They both have gotten kicked out of children's sports games. <laughs> he is very passionate about hockey, and he got kicked out, I think, of one of his son's sports you? games. I, I have moles everywhere I go. Okay, audience, here's your chance. Let's give it up and bring the house down for Kevin Reddy, entrepreneur extraordinaire. <laughs> Well, 
Well, thank you. That, that is not a moment that I'm deeply proud of. Um, but I am intensely competitive and, you know, I was hoping that I would normally get yellow carded. For those of you that have to watch the parent video, that's a warning. Um, I don't think what I said was that bad, but he kind of skipped the warning and just threw me out. Uh -uh. Anyway, tonight, uh, first of all, thank you very much for being here, and uh, I, I appreciate uh, your time and interest in Noodles and Company. Um, over the next uh, hour, what I'd like to share with you is a little bit about the Noodles story, some of the interesting inflection points uh, in our history, talk to you a little bit and share some insight into what we believe is important. And I'll touch a little bit on our business philosophy, on our values, on our culture. And I'll try to put that um, in context of the restaurant industry. So hopefully you'll learn a little bit about us, and at the end we'll have plenty of time for, for some Q&A. Uh, I'm hoping that as a Colorado-based company and a lot of restaurants here, that most of you have been to Noodles & Company. Um, anyone not been to Noodles & Company? That isn't ashamed to raise their hand? Mm -hmm. no? Okay. Uh, well, that's great. Hopefully everyone has been to Noodles & Company and can really can come a lot more often. I'd like to begin with a short 55-second video that is on our website, so some of you may have seen it. The reason why I'd like to start with it, I think it captures three things that we think are critically important to the dining experience. The first is really good food. The second is that we serve it with genuine, nice people. And the third is in a friendly, welcoming place. So with that, I, I'll play the video. Hopefully you like that. And for those of you that haven't eaten dinner and that made you a little hungry, we do have a restaurant on campus on Evans just a few blocks away. So if you want to go enjoy Noodles and Company after dinner, that would be great. Um, on the slide behind me, um, we've listed a few things that we believe we do really, really well at Noodles and Company and better than most of the other eating and drinking out choices that you have. Um, the first is we have a world of flavors under one roof. For those of you that have been with the brand from the beginning in 1995, you'll know that we have dishes from around the world, and the flavors are inspired from Asia, Mediterranean, and America. Um, another thing that you probably know is that every dish is cooked to order. We have a real kitchen, we do real cooking, we make each dish for each guest as they order it. And it's totally customizable. So if you like one sauce and you'd rather pair it with a different noodle, or you want more broccoli or less broccoli, um, or any other vegetable, we can do that for you. We have a lot of variety and choice in our menu. So we really cover healthy to indulge in extremely well. We have um, like 16 dishes under 400 calories in our restaurants, and, and we put all the control in our guest's hands. So you control kind of the portion size that you'd like, the sauces that you'd like. You can come in one day and have a wonderful bowl of mac and cheese, and the next day have a Bangkok curry with shrimp that has, you know, 325 calories in it. So we really try to meet your needs in whatever diet that you may be on. And as I mentioned uh, about the dishes, we have favorites of kids to adults. And that's one of our best strengths is that Parents can come in with their kids and their family, um, know that they're feeding them and making a great choice for the kids, and can enjoy something that's a little more sophisticated for their palate 
um, and even have a beer and a glass of wine with that. Uh, as I said before, you know, we have surprisingly good food to a lot of people. The other thing we hear a lot of is we have surprisingly nice people and very, very friendly people. Um, and in today's environment, you know, value is so important. I think this, this last one is that we serve those made-to-order dishes so fast, generally within about five minutes of when you order, we get it to the table, um, and there's no tipping. You know, so we believe that we should provide a certain level of service, and that's our responsibility, so you can enjoy the amount of time you're there, whether that's you know, 15 minutes or 30 minutes, um, and you don't have to tip. Um, and nowadays, particularly through the last several years, value perception and what do you get for your dollar is so critical. Because um, really, you know, eating out is, it's discretionary. You don't have to do it. So for a restaurant concept to be successful today, people have to want to go out to experience your, uh, your food or your dining experience. It's, it's not a given. You can easily stay at home. And that's what's making the restaurant industry so competitive today and why there's been so many closures over the last few years is folks that, that haven't been able to steal market share from other people. Uh, I want to take you a little bit, little bit back to the beginning in 1995. Um, our very first restaurant that's pictured up there in the upper uh, left or right-hand corner, depending on if you're out there standing here, uh, does anyone know where that restaurant is or recognize it from 10 years ago, by chance? Cherry Creek, thank you very much. A lot, a lot of people recognize it. Right here in Colorado, down in Cherry Creek, was the very first restaurant for Noodles and Company. Ironically, the second was in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, so, not really close, but, but Aaron, has a, our founder, has a really good story about why it was there. Uh, and that's a shot of part of the very first menu board back in 1995. And um, you can see there was two soups on there, and it was sorted kind of by hot noodle dishes and cold noodle dishes. That's how the brand was communicated to the guests uh, in the very, very early days. Uh, the concept was really founded on the principle of bringing all these great noodle dishes and flavors from around the world and serving them under one roof. And that belief is still something we hold true to today and something we do very well. Uh, on the right uh, are just a few examples of some of the branding and the personality that was involved in the advertising. Um, very early on, we used a lot of noodle imagery. Um, the brand was definitely playful, whimsical, um, in terms of its humor and what we tried to convey. Uh, I would tell you that this model worked extremely well for almost 10 years. From 1995 to 2005, the brand um, and the, the manager team built almost 100 noodles and company restaurants in about nine to 10 major markets in the United States. Um, very successful, great customer loyalty, wonderful tasting food. Somewhere in that eighth, ninth, 10th year, the company hit, I think, one of its first real inflection points. Um, the carb-conscious diets were out and providing a lot of headwinds, so there was a lot of perceptions that carbs um, aren't as good for you, but we all know that's not true. <laughs> to be really healthy and fit and active, you need good carbs that give you some great energy. Um, but one of the things that happened and again, I think it's a natural part as you study a lot of entities. The company, um, some of the new restaurants weren't performing quite as well as the earlier classes. Um, same store sales, which is a measure of each restaurant that's been open more than 12 to 18 months, whether it's actually growing in sales and transactions. You know, that's, they started to go a little bit flat. The consumer need states were changing a little bit. And the, and the brand started to level out. It wasn't growing at the same pace that it had in the past. Two other things that were happening at the time of end of 04, beginning of 05. One is that the original management team that had been around for about 10 years built this very successful concept in brand. You know, we're starting to 
think about other things they wanted to do and have fun with and aspire to. So they had lost some management. Um, the company had strategically thought about moving, which was from predominantly company growth to franchise growth. And the investment base had grown to three, about 380, 385 high net worth private individuals that had an average hold time in this space for, within Noodles and Company for about seven years. And for those of you that invest in, in private investments or through private equity firms, you know, that's a long time to go without a liquidity event. Um, so it's about the end of 04 that I started seriously talking to Aaron Kennedy, our founder, uh, and the board of Noodles and Company at the time about the situation and what they wanted to do, um, what the thoughts for the brand were. And I joined in early uh, 2005. And so at this point um, of our inflection, I think we did some things that um, were a little different, that you don't, maybe a little bit higher risk tolerance. Um, but we took the first six months of 05 and decided we're going to really rigorously evaluate the brand. We're going to figure out what are we good at, what are our strengths, what connects with our guests, what are we doing right, what are we doing wrong, because we wanted to, be, to grow beyond being a regional brand to a national brand. Strong belief in the concept and where it could go. So we, we put a plan together. We, we evaluated the, the concept. Um, we invested heavily in a new management team with a ton of industry experience. We remodeled restaurants. We came up with a new design, a new menu board. That was the first time in, in mid-05 that we actually started with the menu board today where we took the dishes and communi actually communicated them in terms of flavors from around the world with Asian, Mediterranean, and American. We um, actually took seven things off the menu. And for those of you in the, in the retail and restaurant space, when you take inventory away that people are buying, it can be a little scary, you know, because folks like that dish. And so you, you think to yourself, you know, when you add up the product mix of the seven items we took off, were we putting at risk, you know, eight or 10% sales decline, potentially, because we couldn't move those folks to another dish. Um, one other thing that we did that was very contrarian, um, but something we deeply believed in, was we lowered the menu prices in 2005. That's something you almost never get credit for. You know, folks don't remember you lowered it. They remember when you raised it back up to the original price, and you, and you get some price resistance. Uh, but anyway, we did a series of things that we deeply believed in uh, for the future of Noodles & Company. Fortunately, we got all that done in about four to six months, built some new restaurants. We, get, we told ourselves in the next six to 12 that either the consumer was going to validate that we made the right decisions or we didn't. Fortunately, all of that worked. Um, the menu was communicated stronger. There was less confusion. Our value perceptions went up. Our new prototypes met a better eating and drinking out atmosphere and occasion, and sales started to grow. Over the last five to six years, um, we've gone from about 100 restaurants to close to 300. So it took us about 10 years to build the first 100, about four and a half to build the second 100, it took us three years to build the third 100, and now we're on a pace to build 100 restaurants in two years. And I think we're not too far away from being, building 100 restaurants a year. Okay, so clearly a lot of consumer success, a lot of economic sex, success. Our box economics are our best in the industry. So we're, it, it's really paying off for us. Uh, that growth has really helped us build word of mouth and get third party uh, recognition. Um, you know, I think about the headwinds of the carbohydrate diet and concerns, it's interesting that our culinary team and our restaurant operators are so good at talking to our guests that they created this awareness that um, 
you really can eat healthy to indulge in, in a noodle and pasta concept. Um, I mentioned that we have, you know, 16 dishes under 400 calories and great flavors in there, and we have a whole grain noodle. So throughout this time, Health Magazine um, has consistently ranked us in their top 10 of one of the most healthiest restaurant concepts and choices in the United States. And I think each of the last five years, Parent Magazine has ranked us in the top 10 as one of the best places and choices for parents to take their kids to eat. So huge difference in swing, where the team has been able to turn a negative into a positive. Uh, you know, within the industry, our, our, we have such a strong, experienced team, many of which could, could run companies throughout the U.S. They have really built um, something that a lot of people look to as a model and a best practice. We actually won uh, Nation's Restaurant News Golden Chain Award um, a few years back as one of the best overall concepts in the United States from idea uh, to execution. Okay, a little bit of the, uh, some numbers I'll share with you. And for those of you that like numbers, I think I only have like two slides with numbers, so these are the two, you, if you like them, you might want to pay attention to. Uh, growth, one of the wonderful things about doubling your size is you provide a lot of people significant opportunities. We have, our team base has grown about 4,800 employees um, in the last few years, and between 2004, um, well, I actually have a slide from 2011 to 2004 where it's going to double again uh, a little bit later. So, again, a lot of growth. Uh, we, we employ over 7,000 people right now in the United States, and that includes our restaurant team members, our corporate staff, which is based here in Colorado, and we have three regional offices, other ones in Chicago in the, um, on the East Coast. Uh, an important metric in retail and restaurant is really the, the second bar graph. And that, the, the SSS stands for same store sales. And that measure really is what analysts look to for the health of the core business. You know, you can generate growth by building new restaurants, and that's wonderful, but what is also very important is the existing restaurants that are open. Are they growing in a positive fashion or have they flattened out, or could they even be declining? And for Noodles and Company, we're one of the, really one of the few concepts that have had 22 of the 23 last quarters, those aren't months, those are quarters of positive same-store sales. We had one like in 09, it's kind of like Snowmageddon, that really like bums me out. Because um, then we could say like 23 out of 20. I think it actually would be like 25 out of 25. But... Um, we're heavily based in Colorado. We have a lot of restaurants in Wisconsin and Minnesota, and we just got, like, hammered with snow and we had a lot of restaurants closed. And even with that, I think we were, like, minus, was it 0.9, Keith? Like, minus 0.9. We should have sent everyone out to buy Rice Krispie treats at, like, 10 to 11. We thought it would be different. Um, but, you know, one of the other interesting things about the same store sales, for us, we have very little price inflation in that number. In fact, you know, when you can compare the price increases that we have uh, experienced over the last six years, it's much lower than inflation at the grocery store, much lower than our, the, our general competitors. Our team really prides itself in trying to create a, a great value. And so we work hard at taking out wasteful costs in the system and being as efficiently as possible. We do not automatically just pass commodity cost price increases onto our guests. You know, so almost every year our price increases. We've had, like I said, we started out with a price decrease. We didn't raise, raise prices for two years after that. And when we generally have, it's been somewhere in the 1% to 3% range and much closer to 1.7%. So very, very modest price increases over the seven years. The bulk of that time frame, we've actually experienced real transaction growth in, in each of our restaurants. Um, the last uh, number on the slide is um, our EBITDA. So that's kind of our, growth, our accumulated growth rate of our bottom line. And so over that five-year-plus period, 
we've had north of a 30% cumulated growth rate in getting the money to the bank. And for the accounting finance types in the, in the audience, any KGAR that starts with a three is a damn good number, particularly coming through a recession. So I'm really proud of our team and how well they invest in the team and invest in the guest experience and get a fair profit to the bottom line. A uh, little bit about our unit growth. Uh, this is another nice, unique, rare story in the industry, particularly from 09, 10, and 11. We have provided our investors, our banks, and our team very predictable, consistent unit growth. And so when you see a lot of concepts that have slowed growth or stopped growth over the last few years, um, we believe in the brand. We have confidence in our team's ability to execute it. We have put a lot of work into the infrastructure and the science of picking real estate. And in fact, our newer classes are outperforming our historical units, which have been growing very, very strong over the last four to five years. So, you know, we ended the year at about uh, 285 units, and as, as I shared before, you know, the 10 years for the first 100, four, and, and we're, we just see a runway. As we analyze the U.S., um, we easily see the potential to be comfortably with between 1,800 and 2,500 US restaurants in the United States alone. So a long runway of growth ahead of us. Um, I expect that we'll hit the 500 units in a, a very reasonable period of time. And then when we do that, I think the path to 1,000 um, and doubling the size of the company again um, will be pretty achievable for us. Again, on a very predictable, predictable basis. So uh, we've been enjoying that. And I think to, ha to be an enduring brand, you've got to make it work on a lot of levels. It has to work for the consumer, it has to work for your investors, where you raise capital, it has to be fun and exciting for the team and provide them a lot of opportunities. And for those few companies that can do that, it is a great place to be because of the enjoyment, the pace you run, and the momentum that you can create. Uh, one other fun fact about unit count. Uh, I think it was back in... I don't know, Keith, do you remember when Cowan and company did that report? Was it 09 or 10? 09. Uh, Cowan and company analyzed um, the thousands and thousands of retail and restaurant companies in the United States. Far and away, the bulk of them were public because of the data that was there. But through their channel checks, they, they had some good data on private companies. In 2009, there were 10 concepts that grew organically at a double-digit rate. Just 10 out of the thousands of restaurants and retail concepts in the United States. We were one of those 10. They took those same 10 that grew at a double-digit unit rate and said how many of those entities had also achieved positive same-store sales. There were six. We were fortunate to be one of those six. And I think when you look at uh, 2010, um, 2011, it's, it's gotten a little bit better in the consumer environment, but not a ton better. So there really is just a, a handful of concepts growing at a positive rate. In fact, I, I think of, of the public companies that are um, growing at a double-digit growth rate. I think there are only three in the restaurant space that I can think of. Buffalo Wild Wings, Chipotle Mexican Grill, and BJ's Restaurant. Last year, Panera slipped out of that, out of that group. But a big base of stores, so obviously they're still building a ton of new units. But those are the only three public restaurant concepts I can think of. You know, and there's a handful of private entities that I know that are in that elite, rare group. And we're very fortunate to be part of that. Uh, Where's Dan? Did I forget anything so far, Dan? We're pretty informal. 
Don't want to think we didn't prepare, but we put the slides together last night. So Dan's going to yell if I forget anything that he thinks is relevant. One of the realities of that growth and success is we need a lot of people. And this chart is just an example of that we're going to need to hire over 5,000 people in the next four years, or from 2010 to 2014 across the United States. Um, it, the picture is a little tough to see. Each of the blue symbols equals five team members in a restaurant. The green are general managers, and the orange are support staff. And again, they're all one of those symbols times five. Um, you know, it is one of the probably most rewarding things for those of us that have been in the industry a long time is to be able to provide job opportunities, whether that's somebody's first job in the beginning of how they, they learn to interact with others and become a member of a team and put the team's values ahead of their personal agenda. Um, how to not just follow in, uh, directions, but how to influence and, and make a difference. Um, it, it, it's something that really keeps a lot of us going to, to be able to do that. And at our rate of growth, it's pretty significant. Um, and, and it's not easy, because we have to hire, we have to hire, retain, train, motivate and inspire all those people across a massive geography. And each of those folks have to understand what is important to the dining experience of Noodles and & Company and important to the culture of Noodles & Company. Um, here's just some of the faces of, of some of the team members. And again, we have, you know, I, I think it's one of the things that I enjoy the most is opening up an email or reading a letter from a guest that mentions just how genuine and nice somebody has been or a story of how thoughtful they were of, or of what they've noticed. Um, we truly have surprisingly nice people across the country. And the, the gentleman in the lower left corner is Keith Kinsey. Keith is our um, chief financial officer and chief operating officer um, who is sitting right there. Um, Keith is a, a partner and friend that I have known for over 30 years. And we've worked together now in three concepts together. We worked together at McDonald's, we worked together at Chipotle, and we're working together now at Noodles & Company. Um, he is really the individual that leads and inspires such a genuine selection of people in the company. So um, his appreciation for each of those team members is amazing. I mean, you could travel anywhere in the country and walk into a restaurant, and many of those 7,000 employees will know Keith by name. And he'll talk to them, and he'll remember something that, it was, that he's talked to them in the past about their personal lives or what's going on. And I believe at the core of, of the brand and why we can execute so well without people being really stressed out is because of what Keith brings to the party. So for, I hope everyone signed a NDA and non-solicitation before you walked in. Um, anyway, that's a little picture of the team. Here's some of what we talk about. And I know this is a really busy slide, so I'm only going to touch on a couple things within each of those bubbles. But when we talk about what's important to us, how we want to behave, how we want to interact, what you have to value. These are some of the things that we talk about and say. You know, it really starts, we, we expect folks to be genuine. Be yourself, okay? Be truthful. And we purposely pick truthful over be honest. Because as a kid growing up, honesty can be relative. Those of you that are parents and already have kids know this. I have two of my young adult kids in the seat, and they can definitely relate to this. You cannot lie to your parent 
by not telling them something and still be honest if we're not artful in how we ask the question. So within Noodles and Company, we talk about being truthful in that we know what folks' intentions are and what they need to know to be successful or to be engaged. So we expect that we will be truthful with each other and have rigorous conversations about everything we have to. And we won't hold something back that's an important to a decision or may be very important to the person we're talking to. Uh, we also have, like, besides being nice and fun and friendly, we have really smart, really competitive people. One of the things under the how we want to behave and what we want to do, uh, one is we believe you have to assume innocence in others. When you're growing as fast as we are, and you're somewhat still building the ship as you sail it, you have to be able to adapt. And we forget stuff. We don't always communicate as thoroughly as we need to. Um, and we forget. And it's easy to get your feelings hurt or to get angry with somebody else if you don't think they're giving you a chance to engage or to influence. Key value, got to assume innocence in others. We make enough mistakes, but we're kind of non-discriminatory at what we're good and what we're bad at. Another one that I really, is one of my personal favorites, is we set slightly unreasonable expectations. And I talk about that all the time. All of our internal plans, all of our expectations to perfection are pretty tough. We don't want to be like, and personally, I don't want to be totally unreasonable, because then you can't in inspire people. You only frustrate people. But within our organization, we want to inspire people enough to accomplish more than what they thought they could, to do more as a team than they thought was capable. We have for six years, and I think most of the teams that um, I've been able to participate in over my, as long as I can remember, and sports teams, and certainly at McDonald's and, and Chipotle, when we ended a year and we looked at our results, we were always one of the best of the best. And when you can do that, it's worth it. You know, your pride goes up, your confidence goes up, you have the wind at your back, you have positive momentum, and at that point, all the effort and intensity is worth it. Because there's just, there's, it makes no sense to me to create goals that are easy. You know, there's, there's really no great sense of satisfaction to achieve something that's common, that, that everybody else could achieve with a little bit of effort. What's important in terms of what we value? Um, you know, we're in the hospitality business. We value serving others. You know, whether someone's in our restaurant for 15 minutes or a half hour, we want them to not worry about anything, to enjoy a great meal, to have something to drink, to not worry about cleaning it up, not worrying about tipping us for something we should do anyway. Um, you know, every one of our team members recognizes and values that a lot of life happens over a meal. You know, some of our most important conversations, you know, with our kids, with our spouses, with our family, with our business associates, often take place over a meal. And that's important to us. Um, we value commitment above compliance. We absolutely think you have to inspire people to do their best, not control them. You know, all of our training philosophies and everything else are designed to rigorously replicate what's important to the brand and stop there. Not go any further. Because we want people to bring their personalities and their life experiences to what they do. And we want them to personally make a difference and feel good about that. Uh, the last one I'll mention is the one in the middle of next to value, which is you have to value the system above your department and self-interest. And this one's critically important about alignment and make sure everyone's rowing in the same direction. Um, 
When you have competitive, smart, self-motivated, driven people, they like to do shit. Excuse me, stuff. <laughs> um, and they have a lot of ideas, and they're good. But sometimes those agendas aren't 100% aligned with the most important thing, and that's the success of the brand. Or they, you know, each of those good ideas has a double-edged sword to it. Um, you know, I can't remember who, whose quote this is, but I've got it written up on the whiteboard in my office. Um, I wish I could give whoever it was credit for it, but somebody may know in the audience. It says, you cannot value the team you lead more than the team you play on. And I look at that every day because we have leaders that, as I said before, could run many companies, create their own companies. And we're able to be successful because everyone puts those egos away. And they come into Noodles and they give 150%. Um, you know, we've got, I think, one of the greatest creative minds in the United States, and Dan Fogarty, who's sitting over there. He has the most incredible sense of style and strategy and what's important. Um, he's the gentleman that really started the quest and journey for Chipotle with food with integrity. It was his idea. He was the one that pushed us to think about supply chain differently back in those days. Um, but that alignment is very important. I wish it actually existed in our political system. Um, but that might, we should say, probably stay away from that in the Q&A. Um, quick thing about the restaurant space. Um, within the industry, we kind of think about quick service restaurants, fast casual, independence, casual dining, a little bit functionally and somewhat in terms of consumer need states. Um, the restaurant industry, I believe, is projected to be around $620 billion in 2012 restaurant industry of all those segments. Um, the industry itself employs about 13 million people. Uh, quick service, you know, fast casual, or quick service restaurants, or McDonald's, Wendy's, Burger King. You know, we, we put Noodles and Company in the center, and if, if you're reading the slide, some of those descriptors are where we believe we add value and are well differentiated from that particular segment um, with still um, building upon some of their strengths. So I think QSR and casual dining are around 170 to 180 billion dollars a piece. The fast casual segment, which all the analysts um, put us in, it's not really how a consumer thinks about it, uh, is about 20 billion dollars at the end of last year. So very small compared to the overall eating and drinking out space. Um, and it's grown, I think, uh, about five billion dollars in the last five years alone. Um, this is really just to illustrate, give me something to talk about the fast casual space. Uh, back in 2000, uh, Noodles and Company was five years old, clearly in the emerging component of fast casual, which is really a space that is between quick service restaurants and the sit down Applebee's, Chili's of the world, the casual diners. It emerged because people wanted better ingredients, better tasting food. Little newer, more contemporary environment. And yet it still had to appreciate and understand how busy their lifestyle is and how fast they have to get in and out. And it still had to be a value. So back in 2000, fast casual was emerging. You think about 2005, um, kind of fast casual 1.0. You know, a lot more concepts have grown in the space, a little more competitive, a lot more choice, even within segments. You know, you had multi multiple Mexican restaurants from Baja Fresh, Qdoba, Chipotle Mexican Grill, multiple better burger places. Um, but in 2005, probably still differentiating ourselves, not necessarily from a direct competitor, but from those other restaurant eating and drinking out occasions. You move forward to 2010 and certainly what we're in today, which is kind of fast casual 2.0, there is a lot 
of choices for the consumer in this space. Um, that is just a short, <laughs> you could probably have 10 pages of the logos of players that try to meet those needs that I just talked about. Better for you ingredients, still fast, still affordable, contemporary environment where you can feel good about what you're putting in your body. Uh, a lot of, uh, for us, there's a lot of new growth in fast casual Mediterranean, fast casual Italian. Um, lot, you know, I only have, I think, Smashburger up there because, uh, you know, the local brand that's here. But you look at the Better Burger place. You know, I don't know how many of them, McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's there are in the U.S. You'd think that, you know, with 50,000 plus restaurants from a capacity standpoint that that segment would be kind of capped out. And yet, Five Guys Smash Burger is incredibly fast-growing concepts. You know, in Colorado alone, you've got Counter Burger, Fast Burger, Cheeseburger, Cheeseburger, Fat Burger. I mean, just, just a slew of them. Ted, intensely competitive place. Um, still, fortunate for us, and one thing that we enjoy, we are one of the only concepts in this space that a guest can still get their favorite Italian, Asian, Mediterranean, American dish all under one roof. Okay, I think it's one of our clearly differentiating positions. Uh, try to pick it up. I don't have a ton more slides, I don't think. Um, but again, the consumer thinks very differently than how we analyze the industry. Um, how, how many of you went out to eat in the last two days? Ate outside the home? That's a pretty easy question, safe bet. Usually everyone raises their hand. Um, I don't know if these are some of the things that you thought about or not when you went to do that. But, you know, how much time do I have? Who am I going out to eat with? How much do I want to spend? What do I feel like eating? What occasion is it? Am I out with a coworker? Am I going by myself? Is it a date night? You know, do I got to have that? I need a quieter space because I have this tough conversation with my oldest son because he's got to be grounded again. You know, those, those kind of things. <laughs> um, interesting thing about that, we're competing to try to match up those needs with the brand. And the answers to those questions change every day. Because your eating and drinking on occasions change. Your motivations change. So it, it, it's not as easy as it would seem. Uh, this is just a, another illustration of kind of a brand and an evolution of a brand. But, you know, really you start off with the idea. And that idea generally is solving for a need. What do people need? What do they want? What opportunity exists? You know, that second thing is you've got to bring it to life. You have to be able to execute on that game plan. You have to be able to pay attention to the details. You have to connect the need with the solution of your guests, which is part operational, part marketing. And then, inevitably, in a concepts life cycle, you're forced to reinvent yourself, stay relevant, innovate, or you decline and you go away. You know, I, I wish I could remember how many Fortune 500 concepts existed 20 years ago and how many are still in business today. You know, I, I heard someone speak and they shared that stat, but it's amazing how many of those concepts don't even exist anymore. Yeah. Um, you share a little bit about about how, our, how we're innovating, but you know, a couple words about that. When your brand's been around and you have this loyal following of guests, it's a little scary to change it. You know, so management teams today, and there's a lot of innovation and a lot of experimentation going on today in the restaurant space, probably more today than any time in the last uh, 30 years. And a big chunk of that is because we've had fewer restaurants at the end of 09, 2010 and 2011 than we had at the beginning of each year. That is the first time that's happened in 50 years. I think there's been around 10,000 restaurants closed each of the last couple of years. 
majority of them independents, and really only a handful that have been growing and, and building market share. Even within the fast casual space, there's when people open and close because they, they can't connect the delivery with the need of the guests that they're trying to fill. So, um, and in, with any innovation, I think you really have to understand what's core to the brand that you have to keep so you don't lose your core guests. You have to be th able to think about the future. What, what's going to happen that you don't know about? You know, we're big data folks, and a lot of our management team has pretty strong accounting finance background as, as well as operational. One of the interesting things to watch within our organization is we think we use data well, we know it, we know what data you need for decision making, but in the real tough decisions, it's less relevant. Because data is historical. You can learn an awful lot from it. You can study what happened in the past. Your future is about the unknown. There is no data about the future. So you, you really have to think about what wisdom you apply to the learnings and what you believe about the vision and where you want to go. And you have to have the risk tolerance to go for it. You have to believe in it more than data would tell you it would work. Because if you could just look at data, you know, there'd probably be a lot of people doing it. And in, in this day of digital media and everything else, it is so easy to copy ideas. Because anytime someone does something that's work it, working, like half the US knows, and like on Twitter, something like that. A um, couple shots of uh, some of our innovation and I'll, that I'll close with, and then we'll go to Q&A. You know, who's, who's had, like, the truffle mac and cheese? Fancy pants, chili mac and cheese, great, thank you. Um, bacon, cheeseburger, mac and cheese. Um, you know, one of the things that, that we do is limited time offers. We have great credibility in our mac and cheese. It really is, like, the best in the world. <laughs> it's, like, super yummy if you haven't had it. Um, so the next time you really want to treat yourself, have some mac and cheese. But... Uh, you know, we built kind of an adult version of that, and I'll show you a couple of the ads in the next uh, couple of slides. We also have a wonderful line of salads. During the summer, we had a, a very berry salad with fresh strawberries and a little bit of fig dressing across the top of it, it and it was outstanding. Right now, we um, are sourcing Fuji apples in them, and it, it, it really is great. Uh, behind it is our backyard, backyard barbecue salad, and our culinary team came up with the concept that you know, there's a lot of barbecues that go on during the summer. So if we take that concept and deconstruct it and put it in a salad, you know, with grilled chicken and corn on the cob and everything else, it'd be like, taste really good and people would love it. Well, they were right. It turned out well. We, we actually have corn on the cob in the restaurants that we made, and we, and we cut the corn in sheets off the cob and, and put it on the salad. So again, take that little extra time on those details so that when we deliver the dish, there's a little bit of a surprise there. Uh, the bottom right, um, square balls. I don't know if anyone's ordered square balls. Heard of them, read about them? Square balls? Okay. It about fits with the product mix, unfortunately. Um, okay, sales pitch. We have, well, okay, we serve in white round balls. We have this thing called square balls. Because they're so big, you need corners. I don't know. It was something like that. I can't remember. Um, but these square bowls serve, you know, four to five people. They are great for feeding the family. Great for a business lunch, small groups. You know, we, we have a lot of people that order um, a salad and then an entree, a penny rosa with chicken or spaghetti and meatballs or whatever. So they, they really are a phenomenal answer to... Um, that eating and drinking out occasion that, that some people call home meal replacement. The other thing we're playing around with is uh, desserts and appetizers. Which you might think is a little strange when you're in an economy and people are cutting back on spending. And if you ask folks, one of the first things they say they're cutting back on is desserts and appetizers. We do things a little differently, but we really don't have them. So they're, they're incremental for us. And, and true to our concept, of letting people enjoy what they want and putting control in their hands. 
You can go through our line, order what you like and you love and what your favorites are, sit down at the table, and we'll bring it to you. If you want to linger a little bit longer, if you'd like to have some dessert, we've got a double chocolate espresso cake in in test that's great. We have this trace leches cake that's really good, and I love the carrot cake, actually. Um, A couple appetizers, we've got edamame. We've got some great noodle bites, which are these noodle shells filled with um, a lasagna, a vegetable mix. We bake them in our ovens. They are to die for. Um, And we have a spicy sriracha shrimp as well. So we haven't rolled them out. They're just things that we're learning to see if our guests will appreciate them and like them and how often they'll buy them. It's going pretty good. Has anyone been to 29th Street in Boulder? Okay, thank you. I don't know if you've noticed this. Internally, we have something we're calling PLUS, which for our internal team stands for Please Let Us Serve. And, you know, again, building on that strength, that strength of really nice, friendly people, you know, a lot of the frustration of going out to eat at times with a table service is either, either hover and they don't let you enjoy your meal, and they're always suggestive selling things, or they're never around when you need them. We believe that we can create a niche with an eating and drinking out space that provides a non-intrusive, informal, friendly level of service if you want that extra beer, another glass of wine, or you'd like a dessert, or if you forgot anything else. And we are experimenting with this in one of our Boulder, Colorado restaurants. It's going really well. The dinner day, we're only doing it at dinner right now. Um, That dinner day part is up significantly. And I think we'll, you know, we're gonna put a couple of these restaurants in other regions across the United States so our operation teams can get used to it and gain confidence in it. And then we'll probably, uh, if things continue on track, slowly roll it out. Uh, but you can see, it just, it just fits naturally. You know, we added to a restaurant that was several years old and it just, it just naturally fits. Feels like it's been there all the time. A um, Couple quick ads. Uh, um, we have, for those of you that have noticed all the chalkboards in our restaurants and, and how our branding has evolved, um, some of these ads are really an extension of that. It's, it's kind of a chalkboard look with some natural writing. Um, I think the one on the top right's funny, particularly with what's going on in politics. For those that can't read it, truffle mac and cheese, possibly the only dish that bridges the gap between the 99% and the 1%. Uh, it's a lot of copy, so it's tough to like, get a billboard on Capitol Hill for that, but uh, I'd, I'd love to be able to put it there. We, we have it in print. Uh, but again, a lot of different uh, ads there. Um, I think I have two slides left before Q&A. You know, the, I, the, these three words we think sum up the brand pretty well. You know, we try to be and we think we can be uh, your world kitchen. You know, we cook everything to order. You can customize anything. We bring a world of flavors under one roof, and it's personal because we do it every bowl, every guest, every time for each individual. So we actually haven't used this anywhere. So if nobody has any questions and you want to share your opinion on two things, what do you think of when you read those three words? Your world kitchen. I am kind of curious what comes to mind. And then the second part is when you associate them with noodles. Does it make sense? Is it it relevant to you? So... Little free mother-in-law research for me if I can get away with it. Uh, actually, I don't really have any comments to this slide. I just like it. <laughs> kind of going through pictures. This is a restaurant in downtown Kansas City in the plaza. It used to be a McDonald's restaurant, and we converted it. And it, it I wish I could show you about 10 slides, so it is a beautiful restaurant. It's a wonderful, wonderful use of copper and tile and everything else. And, Dan says, like, the people moving really fast and kind of invisible or kind of like the vampires. With that, that is the end of my comments. Sorry for being a little long. You guys have been great. I appreciate it. And I think we have time for uh, Q&A right now. Kate?
Any questions? Industry, noodles and company? I was fascinated by, by the uh, Baja Fresh because they, they sold the concept to Wendy's for hundreds of millions of dollars. And it, I'm, you're an insider, so I never heard the real story as to why they failed and then Chipotle uh, did well. Um, that's an interesting question. At the time uh, Keith and I were at, at Chipotle, I think Baja Fresh had 87 restaurants and Chipotle had 15 at the time. So very big disparity. Um, although Baja Fresh was heavily concentrated in California. You know, I, I think it's a lot about what people believe they're good at and, and how they expanded the brand. Um, Baja Fresh grew pretty well. Interesting enough, our current investors were investors in Baja Fresh and were on the selling side when Baja Fresh got sold to Wendy's. So they were on the right side of that transaction. Uh, I think we were very disciplined and focused in the growth of Chipotle at the time. And I think when Baja Fresh got sold to Wendy's, there was two very different strategies. Um, McDonald's believed, and the approach we took at the time, um, was to pull resources from McDonald's. And to really, I think McDonald's management very much respected and appreciated what Chipotle did well and did not try to overtake the brand. And even though it was an 800 pound gorilla at the table, um, I was the first McDonald's employee to join Chipotle. Um, Keith joined it. We, we really only had a handful of folks. It, we, we really built that brand organically and to our strengths and relied on infrastructure and talent where we needed it. I think Wendy's took Baja Fresh and really tried to scale it similar to the way they scaled a QSR. And they, and they changed a lot of the strengths of the brand that connected with guests that they were looking for and, and just made a series of missteps that ultimately blew a couple hundred million dollars in three years and ended up the, the concept being sold back. So I, I, that's what I would attribute it to. Don't know if that's right, that's one person's opinion. On. You can yell, I can. Could you uh, elaborate on your the rationale between the, the relationship of company-owned stores versus franchise stores? There's sure. almost seems like you shouldn't bother to franchise at that level. Sure. Um, you know, several brands make a decision early on how do they want to take the, the, the concept to market. Do you want to do it franchising or through company operations? Right before I joined, uh, Noodles & Company had moved to a franchising strategy after building a lot of company restaurants. We put that on a strategic pause. My experience in the restaurant industry is restaurants that are run well do very well. And they serve a lot of guests, a lot of transactions, and make a lot of money. And so we put franchising at the time on a strategic pause because we were going to you know, make some changes to the brand and we didn't want our franchisees to invest in it. We believe in franchising. We do have about 20% of the system that's franchised. I would like to see that grow, at, you know, at at least that pace. Um, but the reality is we're good operators. You know, we have some of the highest restaurant level margins in the industry. I, I actually think we, we might have the second or third highest of any restaurant concept in the United States. So very good returns. Um, we're building sales on a consistent basis, and we're very disciplined in finding real estate. So we're going to keep growing the corporate brand. We'll be a high-growth company by any analyst metric on that basis, and I'd like to see franchising add to that because you get the right partners that have their life's blood in that and their money. They're just intellectually curious. They bring ideas. They ask provocative questions. They help you be better, and then you can grow faster. So um, right now, we don't really intermingle the markets. We try to find the right partners, give them a territory, and let them build it out. And we, we just hired a person for franchise sales last December. And he's starting to generate some really good interest for us. So thanks for the question. Hi. Um, I'm a little bit disappointed that you didn't mention anything about the expansion in China. So. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Chris. Well, so where in China are you from? 
Uh, Shandong province originally, okay. but I was in the south for a while. Okay. And I remember you once mentioned that you were in about to expand in Hong Kong or Guangdong area first. Yeah. So my question is that um, we are in a really different market. We, if you call noodles company a fast casual restaurant, maybe 90% of the restaurants in China are that category. And we don't tip. And we cook noodles a lot. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, it, 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 it is an interesting challenge. We are looking at uh, international. Um, yeah, but we, we focused in on Shanghai. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, uh, I've had a couple trips over the last few years. I, I actually worked in Asia for McDonald's for three years. Um, so I have some familiarity with it, but it was a long time ago. Um, but as Chris said, and it is kind of funny, it's like selling ice Eskimos noodles to the, to the Chinese. But one thing interesting that we believe, th there's a massive opportunity, because there are a lot of noodle shops that are, are kind of like QSRs in the US that provide a tremendous value that are inexpensive, and there's a lot of them, like every corner. And then there's some high-end, wonderful noodle shops. But that space in the middle is wide open. And there isn't a concept in China that brings the best flavors from Italy or Japan or Korea um, within the region of Asia or around the world, all under one roof, to a culture that loves noodles and can eat it three times a day. So I will be the first to say we're not going to get distracted in the U.S. We have a limited focused amount of resources on this. We've got a capital plan of what we're going to invest to gain learnings and, and proof of concept. Um, so our, we know where our bread is buttered, but we also think you have to kind of that, you know, do you spend your time in the present or in the future? We I firmly believe you've got to do contradictory things well. So we're really analyzing that. In fact, I leave for uh, Shanghai on the 13th of February um, to go look at, I, th I think, what we have narrowed down to be our, our first four to five potential real estate locations. Um, then we'll give it a try, and uh, we'll learn whether or not we can sell noodles to the Chinese. And, um, <laughs> if, if we can, I, I think it's enormous, because I think there's 18 million people in Shanghai, 15 million in, in Beijing. Guangzhou is somewhere around 12. There's projected to be 50 million people in and around those three cities in the next seven years. So if it works, <laughs> it's going to look like a hell of a good idea. If it doesn't, please don't tell anybody that we tried it. Do you have time for one or two more questions? Yes? Yes, sir. Uh, with the upcoming election, there's been a lot of debates on the uh, government's role in running and regulating private business. And I wonder if you might comment on how uh, uh, entities like the FDA, OSHA, uh, EEOC, and things like the ADA have affected for better or worse uh, the operations of Noodles and Company. Okay, um, interesting question. You sure we have time for one more? <laughs> well, full disclosure, I am a registered Republican. I am fairly frustrated with our political system. I don't think either party solves problems. I think there's a lot of denial, blame, and not problem solving. I believe in, the free, in free markets and that, you know, I, I grew up in Pittsburgh. I, I started working since I was 11. Um, I've seen folks become successful through hard work. Um, it's made an enormous difference for me and my family. Um, I am not, and I am, I am a fan of smaller, limited, focused government. Um, I personally, I think it's a lot of the regulation is very well intended, often gets screwed up in the execution, and clearly makes business more expensive and more difficult to run. I think it's one of the reasons why, and let's face it, the consumer is the biggest part of GDP. You know, 70% of the US GDP is, is growth from small businesses. Um, a lot of them aren't making it. Uh, so I, I, I think we need it. I just don't think it's very smart and thoughtful. And I'll, I'll give you one quick example. Menu labeling. 
and, and I've had the chance to, to go with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce um, and, and talk to senators. And at the end of the month, I, um, I have a chance to go back um, with a group of CEOs to meet at the White House and with some um, heads of um, different divisions and departments that set policy. But in menu labeling alone, this, this idea of, you know, how do you inform the guests so they know if they are interested in calories or ingredients or content, um, that that's important. And we agree with that. We have a lot of information in brochures in our restaurant and on our websites so that folks can make informed choices. The law has read uh, that we have to display it on our menu boards. And it, it, at one point in time, the law said, the font we use has to be the same size as the listing of the dish. I mean, it is stupid. Okay? The, the amount of minutia that I think our legislators get into when they have no concept of the industry is ridiculous. And, and, and I wish they could, even when they're well-intended, I do think it gets screwed up. And I really wish some of our politicians would say, this is what's important, this is what I believe in, this is what I'm going to fund, these, these are who we're going to help. And we could, we could make it a lot simpler for everybody. I mean, there's, there's just way too much money and time spent. We spend a ton of money on attorneys just trying to understand the health care law. You know, and even the experts can't explain it to us. That is a problem. So I better stop. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So the only problem with having the CEO of Noodles & Company talk to us over dinner hour is I am now starving. How about the rest of you? So here's a couple more fast facts. You saw that great slide where they had all of the awards for noodles and companies, but I want to brag a little bit on Kevin as well. In 2010, he was named by Ernst & Young, the Rocky Mountain Entrepreneur of the Year, and by Nation's Restaurant Magazine for both 2010 and 2011. He's one of the top 10 to watch in the restaurant industry. And most importantly, fast fact, he is the parent of a University of Denver pioneer. So. He's a great way to kick off 2012 Voices of Experience. I hope you'll join us back here on March 12th with Kent, De uh, Kent Theory with DeVita, the CEO and chairman of DeVita, and Carol Tomei, the CFO of Home Depot on April 23rd. Please join us in the lobby for a reception. Thank you for being part of the Daniels community. Thank you.